And the Buddha was searching for the path to the deathless. The first piece of right view that he discovered was that concentration was the path. and that it was something to be developed. This is a skill that we're working on here, how to get the mind to settle down with a sense of well-being, focused on one topic. It can be the breath, it can be the body, it can be thoughts of goodwill. The important thing is that it allows you to have an expanded sense of concentration. They use the word egakata to describe the, the state of concentration. Sometimes it's translated as one-pointedness. But the word aga in there, which is said to be point, can also mean gathering place. And that seems to be the meaning here, actually. You're gathering all your mind around one topic, but it's not just in one point. The Buddha describes concentration as a full-body awareness. If you're contemplating the parts of the body, think of skin, because skin is all around the body. If you're contemplating the breath, think of the breath as not just the in-and-out breath, but the flow of energy throughout the body. You want a concentration that has a large frame like this, because that's the kind of frame you can carry into daily life. If your concentration is too one-pointed, then as soon as you shift the point, then the concentration is lost. But with the whole body as a frame, what the Buddha calls mahakatang chitang, the enlarged mind. Things can come in, things can go out within the frame, but the frame is still there. So you may start with one point, but then try to expand the range of your concentration so that your mindfulness is, in the Buddhist term, immersed in the body. You're fully aware, as much as possible, of everything that's going on all around, inside the body. As the Buddha said, this is going to start with some directed thought and evaluation, because you have to keep reminding yourself in the beginning to stay here. And evaluation is what evaluates how well the mind is settling in, what needs to be done to make this a better place to stay. The analogy the Buddha gives is of a bathman trying to work water through a pile of, in those days was soap powder kind of like flour. You worked the water into that, and then you had a soap dough that you used to, to bathe yourself with. Kind of like making bread nowadays. You work the water through the dough so that all the flour is moistened, but there's no water dripping out. In other words, you're working with the energies in the body and trying to get them smoothed out throughout the body, a sense of ease throughout the body. And sometimes that means working through patterns of tension, tightness in different parts of the body. And sometimes you have to work through your perceptions of what's going on in the body. There may be a pain in some part of the body, and it, the mind pictures it to itself as a wall. And the breath will seem to stop there at the wall. Well, you've got to change that perception. The wall is porous. Pain is not a wall. The blood can still flow, the breath can still flow. And when you hold that perception in mind, you find that a lot of the tension that builds up around the pain gets dissolved away. So it takes some time to work through the energies in the body. When you breathe in, does it feel like the energy is going up or down? If it goes up, is it comfortable or is it getting stuck in the head? If it's getting stuck in the head, think of it going down through the, the throat, down into the chest. Don't push it. Don't exert any pressure on it. Just think of things opening up. 
this is more the work of allowing, relaxing tension. And the different patterns of tension that create walls in the body get dissolved away. There's a greater sense of oneness throughout the body. It seems like your awareness is filling the body, the breath is filling the body. It's like they're one. When things come together like this, you can drop all the evaluation and then focus on just maintaining this sense of what you've got here. The breath, the well-being, the sense of refreshment, keeping in mind that it's the focus you've got and your intention. Those are the causes. When the causes are focused properly, then the well-being, the refreshment, they'll come on their own. And we work on this because it's nourishing and also provides an ideal place for the mind to see what's going on. Because you, as you get more settled in the body, the movements of the body get quieter and quieter, until it finally feels like the breath, in and out breath stops. There's still a sense of energy suffusing the body. But the need to breathe feels less and less and less. And when the movement of the breath and the movement of the energies in the body calms down, that's when you can see the movements of the mind for themselves a lot more clearly. So this is why this is such a central part of the path, both because it provides you with the nourishment to stick with the path and also because it gets the mind in a position where it can see itself clearly. It has a more refined sense of what well-being is, and that allows you to see more clearly what what stress and suffering are. You can see that there are movements of the mind that add stress to this state. If you were to latch on with them and go with them, they build up a sense of stress. You notice that because you have something better to compare it with. It was, this was how the Buddha discovered the Four Noble Truths. Realizing it's clinging that's creating a burden for the mind. If the mind hadn't been in concentration, he wouldn't have been able to see that. Because when we cling to things, usually we're not paying attention to the act of clinging, we're paying attention to things we're clinging to. Oblivious to the stress that we're creating for ourselves. But when you have this more refined clinging, and there is going to be some clinging in the state of concentration, it helps you to see the grosser ones more easily. The question came up when we were in Paris, how do you practice concentration without clinging? And we said, there's no way you don't do it without clinging. There's got to be some. After all, you're working on a skill, and it requires that you be dedicated to it, and there has to be some sense of really wanting to do this. And then once you've got it, you have to have a strong sense that it's worth protecting. Because the essence of any skill is, on the one hand, learning the techniques, but on the other hand, it's learning the value of mastering those techniques. If you don't see the value, then the techniques get boring. We had a visitor here the other day saying that she'd been reading and listening to my talks on breath meditation. She liked the basic dharma, but she didn't like this breath meditation. It sounded boring. The techniques of focusing on the body, working with the breath. Well, they in and of themselves could be boring, aside from the fact that they are so important in helping to alleviate stress and suffering for the mind. 
you see the danger of a mind that's not trained, compared with the benefits of having a mind that is trained, then you're willing to put up with the tedium of having to keep coming back to the breath, coming back to the breath, working with the breath energies again and again. This applies not only to the breath, but whatever your meditation object is. But I have a strong sense this really does make a difference, not, any, not only in providing a comfortable place to stay right now, but training the mind in qualities it's going to need in order to keep itself from creating unnecessary suffering for itself, unnecessary suffering for people around you. So the breath may be something very ordinary, but working with it does a lot of good for the mind. The mind in concentration may not be interesting, at least from the outside. There's not a lot of creative thinking going on once the mind finally does settle down. The, the creative thinking is in getting it to settle down. But once you've got it settled down, the next step is just to stick with it and to be very protective of it. Which at first may be tedious, but then you begin to realize you're seeing things in your mind you didn't see before. And this is when it gets fascinating. You see how the mind creates little worlds for itself. You see how the mind lies to itself sometimes. You understand your own mind a lot better. In the process of unlearning your unskillful habits, you're not tedious at all. So, but as John Lee said, it's, the discernment is not the big, big problem. Virtue is not the big problem. When you're working on the path, concentration is the one that's the big problem. He said it's like building a bridge across, across the river. The pilings on this bank and the pilings on that bank are not the problem, but the pilings right in the middle of the river. They take a lot of work. Concentration is right there in the middle. But the work that's put into coming back again, coming back again, trying to be as sensitive as possible to what you've got here. Is more than repaid by the results you're going to get. 